Well, welcome everyone. I am Scott Edelman, and I am going to read a selection from my new zombie novelette collection, Liars, Fakers, and the Dead Who Eat Them. Uh, it contains two novelettes. The first one uh, is called, uh, well, let's see. The second one is called Faking It Until Forever Comes. That's the one I won't be reading. The one I will be <laughs> reading from is called Only Humans Can Lie. Uh, and then the overarching title, Liars, Fakers, and Dead Who Eat Them, contains a piece uh, from each of them. It is from uh, Michael Bailey, has a collection, uh, a series called, uh, well, it's a word novella spelled backwards, so it's Alavon books. So he's doing these beautifully uh, illustrated uh, books. Uh, as you can see, there are about eight or nine of them inside from a guy named Daniel Sarah, and it's just a nice little package, so I'm just going to dive in, won't be able to read the whole uh, thing. Uh, this, uh, zombies have been very, very good to me. I have something that was called you know, the complete zombie stories of Scott Edelman, and of course I keep writing them, so that, that's now just selected zombie stories by Scott Edelman. <laughs> Tim stared through the front entrance of his restaurant at the destruction within and couldn't bring himself to move forward. The splintered furniture, shattered dishes, shredded paintings, these were all distressing enough. But the blood smeared across the floor affected him far more viscerally than any of that, repulsing him in ways he couldn't control. His labor of love, stuff of life, had never known blood of any kind inside its walls, let alone human blood, let alone the blood of a friend. The hard truth of his life settled over him in that moment. He never should have moved back to Plaxton. After all, it was in the heart of cattle country, not the most welcoming place for a vegan restaurant, even if it was his hometown, where at least he had a few friends who would support, well, tolerate his cause, whether they understood what he was trying to do or not. Maybe he should have stuck it out at that bistro in Austin, and yet, if he hadn't made that leap, he'd already be dead. The cities had been harder hit by this zombie mess than the small towns. It was simple math. The bigger the population, the faster the undead multiplied. But whatever advantage those odds gave Plaxton, the undead had made it here at last. Sorry for your loss, came an all too familiar voice behind him. I'm glad they didn't get you too. That's not making me feel any better, Tim told Sonny, owner of the Longhorn Lounge, at the same time feeling a twinge of guilt for himself, thinking, and I'm glad they didn't get Brittany. The last time he and Sonny had spoken, it hadn't gone well because the steakhouse was going to add foie gras to the menu, which was obscene as far as Tim was concerned, and he hadn't been shy about calling it torture. And yet there the man was, setting all that aside and showing sympathy, too. Well, I'm the one who makes the schedules, which means it's my fault Laura was opening this morning instead of me. Thinking like that will get you nowhere, said Sonny, so just don't, you hear? Sonny patted Tim's shoulder briefly, then nodded through the open doorway. You going in? He asked. I can't, said Tim. You weren't the one who got her call. You didn't hear her crying for help. I just can't. And all that blood. Let me give you a hand then, he said. Tim found himself unable to even step aside as Sonny pushed past him. The man had to step over the broken door itself to enter as it had been split in two when the zombies had busted in. Or had there been multiple zombies? He hadn't been able to tell from the background noise of Laura's early morning call, but surely it had taken more than one of the undead to do this. He watched as Sonny set tables upright again and tried to put the chairs in place around them, but with many of them he couldn't. Their legs had been broken during Laura's battle for life. Tim imagined her pointlessly swinging them as weapons. He pushed that picture from his mind. He had to. He realized Sonny had asked him a question and looked up from the carnage. What was that? He said quietly. I asked, where do you keep your cleaning supplies, a broom, a bucket? You shouldn't be looking at this mess any longer than you have to. I thought we were safe, said Tim. I really did. No one's safe anymore, said Sonny, but we found two of them a short while ago stumbling down Main Street, so hopefully they're the ones who did this and we're in the clear for a bit. And there's a team putting up more fencing even now and out checking the rest, so a broom? Tim waved vaguely at a corner of the restaurant. He barely had the strength to lift his arm and point. Sonny stepped around the counter and walked toward the grill, then froze. Best stay where you are, Tim, he said, voice flat. You don't want to be going back there. Why? Sonny simply shook his head, an act which broke Tim's inertia. He stumbled the length of the room, his feet further cracking already broken plates, and turned quickly around the corner where he gasped to see what was left of Laura. 
or whether you have to assume it had been Laura. It was hard to tell. There wasn't much but a trail of hair and bone, the hair so mad with blood he couldn't tell what color it had been. The zombies had picked her clean. Tim's stomach spasmed, reacting the same way it had the day he'd seen that movie with brutal footage from a chicken processing plant and given up meat. He turned and ran, tripping over the debris of his life's work. He caught himself as he fell, his hand sliding across a bloody patch of floor and coming up red. He screamed, instinctively slapping his palm against his shirt and moaned at the sight of the marks he made there. He spilled out into the street and immediately dropped to his knees, vomiting. All meat was murder, yes, but this meat was so much more. Once his stomach had settled and he was able to stand, he spotted Sonny still in the restaurant, watching him through the busted doorway. The man stepped out into the sun and put a hand on Tim's shoulder again. He never expected comfort from someone like that, but in a moment like this, he welcomed whatever he could get. You just go home, we'll take care of this, Sonny said. I called in a few of the girls. We'll clean your place up so it'll be as good as new. Then you can go back to serving whatever it is you serve. He gave Tim a crooked smile, which told him the man was thinking he still couldn't figure out what kind of breakfast didn't include steak and eggs. Sonny's way of being funny, Tim guessed, but it didn't help lighten the mood. And instead, it brought back all the old pain. Foie what kind of person would even consider that? What's the point, Tim said, baffled as much by Sonny's optimism as his friendliness. It's, it's over. We both know that. Maybe, maybe I should just board the place up. Reopen? No, I, don't, I don't see it. Stuff of life is dead. This was just his luck. Trust the zombie uprising to occur once he'd finally gotten the town, well, some in the town anyway, to accept muffins made without butter and sandwiches that didn't contain flesh. After this, though, Tim shook his head, unable to say anything more. Don't talk like that, said Sonny. There's always a point. You'll be back. I know it. And once you are, I promise this time I'll even stop by and have a bite to eat. We've got to go on, especially now. Tim didn't see how anyone could believe that. His dream had died and the world was dying with it. He looked up at the flowery sign atop the storefront, one which Laura had helped him paint the previous year. The four F's were daffodils, the O was the sun, and... I don't know, Sonny, he said, lost in despair. It's too much to think about right now. No, no, go home. Have some tea. Go to bed. This will get taken care of. I know you never really believe it, but we watch out for each other around here. The way Sonny said tea grated on Tim like the man looked down on anyone who wouldn't rather have a big mug of coffee. <laughs> maybe Sonny didn't mean anything by it, maybe he did, but Tim was so raw he no longer had the ability to tell. He was about to say something in response which he was sure would ignite their hostility when he was saved by the arrival of two of Sonny's waitresses. Oh Tim, I'm so sorry, said Chloe rushing over while Brittany, whose face he'd thought of often after he'd fled the town, and who had been kinder to him than most since his return, tearfully bit her lip behind him. But at least we got the bastards, right? She turned to Sonny, right? He nodded, and then Brittany came forward and touched Tim's arms, which felt a whole lot more reassuring than when Sonny had done it. Let us help you, Tim, she said. And after you reopen, if you need a waitress, why, I'm sure Sonny won't mind loaning me out for a while. To, to be honest, I think he's getting tired of me anyway. And she winked and smiled. Tim stared at her, then down at her hand on his arm, then sighed. Had everyone gone crazy but him? The world had been insane enough even before the zombies came, what with the way people treated animals, and he thought he could do a small part here to change that, but it hadn't been easy, and now that the zombies were coming, the universe wasn't giving him a chance. How would he ever show them that the way they chose to live was wrong? How could they think there was a reason for going on? Let me take you home, Tim, continued Brittany. We'll get you settled in, and then I'll come back and pitch in. You've already seen enough. He let himself be led to the pickup, and as they pulled away, and he watched stuff of life recede in the rearview mirror, he finally allowed himself to cry. Tim thought it silly that his Brittany's pickup neared his restaurant, or what, based on the level of destruction he'd witnessed the previous week, he'd gotten to thinking of it as his former restaurant, no matter how persuasive she continued to be. She told him to close his eyes and not open them again until she told him he could. Yet after all she'd done for him during the days when he barely had the energy to get out of bed, he was willing to do what she asked. She visited him each day since Laura had died, refusing to leave until she'd seen him eat delivering news of how the repairs were progressing and enthusiastically describing how each occasional zombie which slipped through the perimeter fence was dispatched. 
He felt guilty that he couldn't bring himself to leave his home during this time, but with his neighbors promising they'd deal with getting stuff of life in shape, he let them. Doing himself, even attempting it, seemed beyond him. Maybe he was just too sensitive for this new world, but maybe that wasn't so bad a thing. Somebody had to be. He looked forward to Brittany's daily visits, thankful for the human contact. He didn't feel he deserved it, though, and wasn't quite sure why she felt he deserved it, since it was her childhood friend he'd gotten killed. But he'd long ago given up trying to understand people. Animals made much more sense to him. It was the animals and how he hoped to save them, every one that he thought of as he closed his eyes and settled back against the headrest. Once Brittany parked, or at least he assumed she'd actually gone ahead and parked, rather than just stopping in the middle of the street, he heard her door open, then slam, and then his open as well. He felt her hand on his. He'd grown to like that, too. Remember, she said, no peeking. He slid down onto the street, and as she led him, he walked slowly and unsteadily, and momentarily thought, well, wasn't that how zombies moved? Then pushed it down. He was pushing down far too many thoughts lately in order to survive. He jerked to a halt as she yanked back on his arm, then felt her hands on his shoulders, steadying him, positioning him. He heard a jingling close to one ear. You can open your eyes now, she said. When he did, he found himself facing a door. The door is stuff of life. Brittany held out a key and jingled it again. See, she said, I told you we'd get this place back in shape. You can reopen now. He leaned forward and passed his hand over the door's smooth wood, then took a step back and looked up at the sign. The sun, sun there still shone. I don't know what to say. He took the keys from her, closed his fingers around them, and held them so tightly they left marks. Well, go ahead, said Brittany. Open it. Go on in. Her smile lit up her face so brightly he felt she could have stood in for the sun in that sign up above. He wished, but doubted, that he could someday smile like that himself. Had he ever? He slid the key into the lock, still not believing the restoration was possible. He so dreaded the loss of his dream that he hadn't dared to contemplate it much since the day of its destruction. If asked before it had occurred, he'd have said he was made of stronger stuff than that, but obviously he wasn't. Amazing what you can learn about yourself from a zombie apocalypse. He turned the key and pushed the door open. He took a deep breath, remembering the last time he'd stood in that spot, frozen, defeated, guilty. He hesitated, uncertain he could bring himself to go in, then turned to Brittany and saw that smile again. He stepped inside and discovered all was as it had been before. The furniture repaired, their surfaces polished. A new coat of paint, the same color as the old. Pictures reframed and hung. He could almost believe that nothing horrible had ever happened here, that all was the same as before, his life undarkened, all their lives uninterrupted, and at any moment Laura would appear to be that day's right hand for the customers who'd straggled in for morning coffee, but no, he might be a fool, but he was not that much of a fool. And also, there was, there was something, something off. Before he could figure out what that something was, he was surrounded by a noisy mob of neighbors, hugging him, slapping him on the back. People were laughing and proudly pointing out the repairs they'd each been responsible for. There was Sonny and Chloe and Barry, who owned the hardware store, and Burns, who published the weekly advertiser, and the gang he went to high school with, and so many others, all smiling, all looking happier than he'd ever seen them. There were even those he'd never spoken to much before. Yes, maybe he waved and nodded, but, but nothing more. Yet they, too, were present and wishing him well. Perhaps there was a place for him in this town, after all. A beer was pushed into his hand, and he drank without thinking. He normally didn't drink this early in the morning, but then he normally didn't always get eaten by a zombie or have a whole town rise up to rescue him, either. Then he realized they were looking at him as if they wanted a speech. He never enjoyed speaking in front of a crowd, and back when he would try to get street petitions signed, even that was nerve-wracking, because he was always too passionate and ended up saying the wrong thing. He chugged the rest of his beer to gather some nerve. Thank you, he said. Thank you all. I'm touched beyond words. Well, well almost. He paused and smiled, a smile that widened when they laughed as he hoped they would. You have no idea how much this means to me that you cared enough to bring this place back to life so I could continue to share with you what I learned, and I promised that... And then, before he could tell them of the future they'd built together in Plaxton, the freedom they'd someday know, he realized what was off. That smell. Could it be? They wouldn't dare, would they? Did somebody eat a hamburger in here? 
He said, unable to hide his anger, his throat tightened, his stomach unsettled. Whatever sense of camaraderie he allowed himself to feel had fled. Did somebody cook a hamburger in here? Well, I have to feed him, Tim said, Sonny, speaking up from behind the counter. Tim's counter. People were busting their butts in here and working up an appetite. It was all volunteer. No one got paid. I needed to do something to keep them going. Still, a hamburger in here when you know what this place means, when you know what this place stands for? Hell, Tim, until you unlock that door, this wasn't even technically stuff of life again, said Sonny. You weren't even sure you were going to open it again, remember? Calm down. I'm sure the smell will pass. <clears throat> It's about more than just a smell, said Tim. Don't you see? Don't you get it? What you're doing to animals, that's exactly what the zombies are doing to us. His neighbors started muttering then, but Tim could barely hear them over the pounding of the blood in his head. He kept picturing Sonny cooking flesh back there, turning his refuge, his oasis, into a, into a steakhouse. He thought the word with all the hatred of a curse. Now, Tim, don't be ridiculous, said Sonny, stepping out from behind the counter. It's not the same thing at all. We're not like those monsters. We're your friends. Think about what you're saying, and you'll see that you're overreacting. No, I am not, Tim shouted before he realized he was doing so. Why do you think I open stuff of life? This is more than just a business to me. It's a principle. A principle, said Burns. Come on, Tim, we're all doing our best to survive, to keep this town alive, but survival isn't enough, said Tim, cutting the man <laughs> off. A principle, that's what this place is all about. Eventually you were supposed to see and realize what you've been doing and stop. Now, Tim, that's crazy talk, said Sonny, coming closer, <laughs> wiping his hands on his apron as if getting ready to, to what? No one here is going to give up. Meet ever, you know that. Sure, people might stop by here for a coffee or a snack every once in a while, but you're a business owner, not a missionary. You're not going to convert anyone. And if that's what you're thinking, if that's what you're hoping to achieve here, you've made a big mistake. The only mistake I made was in thinking any of you are my friends, said Tim, his hand shaking. He set down his empty beer bottle before he could drop it. Take a deep breath, Tim, said Brittany, stepping up and touching his arm, a touch which this time did nothing to calm him. The only thing a deep breath will do is remind me of how you killed and ate something here, he said. Why did you all really do this anyway, so you can have another excuse to laugh at me, so you can sneer at what I'm trying to do here? Tim, these people are your friends, said Brittany. They just wanted to help. I don't need their help, he said, his words infused with all the bitterness that had been bred in him by this town. Actually, that's where you're wrong, Tim, said Sonny. You do need our help. Sonny shook his head and spoke to the others, treating Tim as if he wasn't there. That's what neighbors are, right, said Sonny, people helping each other. But though Tim may be our neighbor, we are obviously not his. He doesn't want us to be. When he left here, he told us the way he really felt about us. When he came back, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I let myself believe it was because Plaxton still had a place in his heart. That's what all of us believe. That's why we worked so hard here. But I was wrong. We all were. The reason he returned is obvious, isn't it? It was because he learned he couldn't take advantage of the folks in the big city, so he needed to get back here and take advantage of us. I'm not trying to take advantage of anyone, Tim said. No, said Sonny, spinning so quickly that Tim took a step back. If that's so, then maybe you should have just said thank you and shut up. Tim had never been any good at shutting up. <laughs> Perhaps that was one of the reasons he had to leave Plankton in the first place. He remembered as he looked at the expectant faces all the things he'd once said to them and what they'd said in return. A spiral of confusion and misunderstanding that sent him running first away, then back. They were confused again now, not yet fully hardened against him, but he knew that with the wrong word from him, those old expressions he knew too well would return. There was so much he wanted to say, so much in his heart he was sure would convince them, but he fought against saying them, because when did he ever not say the wrong word? Instead, he simply said, thank you. But he found he couldn't shut up and leave it at that, as Sonny suggested. He followed it up with an offer to make dinner for them all later that night. An offer meant mostly with mumbling and shuffling of feet. <laughs> That's okay, Barry, said. We already spent a lot of time here. I think it's best we got back to our real jobs. Barry nodded at Sonny. Sonny nodded at Barry, and Tim knew what each really meant. They didn't want his dinner. They wanted a dinner that had died, a dinner with eyes, a dinner with a soul. He understood then understood with no more illusions. These people weren't going to stop on their own. If there was going to be an end to killing, it would take more than just a restaurant. It would take action. Um, and that is perhaps, I don't know, the first quarter of the first 
of two novelettes. The first one is about the vegan restaurant and what's happening in this small enclave, and the second one is taking place in a different town, a small town waitress who dreams of being a movie star, and when a camera crew gets trapped there and wants to keep making a movie, even though their star has been bitten and turned into a zombie, uh, she gets involved with that. And uh, all copiously illustrated, and there are copies available in the dealer's room, should anyone be so inclined after this reading. Uh, any questions in the few minutes remaining, or thoughts? Well, speak, speaking as a I, I thought that was like you went right to the right place where you know, the, the idea of zombies sort of fitting in with the concept of any eating of meat. I, I really think that now is it, is it meant to be funny or is it meant to be. <laughs> well, maybe the way I'm reading it, it becomes funny. Well, he, the character is obviously someone who is overly earnest and yeah. overly sincere and right. inept at you know, propagating his concept. Someone else doing what he's doing might have been able to pull it off, right. but that's, this guy can't. It's a heavily flawed character. Jonathan. I know, that's, that's why I was, I was laughing so hard, yeah. because I was already thinking, like, all he had to say is, thank you so much, let me cook you dinner tonight. If yeah. he had just done that, everyone yeah. would have shown up. Yeah. This was yeah. so the story yeah. would have been over. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just so good. No, it's a story of a guy who basically always says the wrong yeah, thing, <laughs> and things happen as a result of this, the action is but taken. It, it as he is, continues it, trying to convince them what's really wrong. But, uh, well, and it, it gets pretty gruesome, uh, shall we say. It's zombie stories. I, 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 I've read it twice, so I, I would say more. As a carnivore, um, it, coming at this from a completely different, non passionate about uh, being a vegan or a vegetarian, um, I thought it was really, really well done, Scott. I mean, it made the point of. Uh, it, it, it brought the point home, and the rest of the story really, really does it, it does that. Mm -hmm. it makes mm -hmm. makes people people think, and I never thought I, I would, but I, but I continued with it as a as a vegan story. And by the end, I, I was like, that's really, really clever. Well, that's that's all cool. And the title of that one, by the way, again, was "Only Humans Can Lie." <laughs> is the well, it, it is the interesting problem of any activism is that. Where do you where do you draw the line? Where do you say thank you and shut up? It's yes, because too much passion and you just drive people away right, instead yeah. of luring them in. Yeah, you know you're supposed to be giving them stuff and say not tell them it's vegan. You know, and right. then they say, oh, they, oh, that's really good. That's oh no, it wasn't good after all. I, I you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Right. Once you say it's yeah. vegan, it's like getting the kid to eat broccoli or something like yeah. that. One of the that's the greatest cool. salesmen I've ever met for veganism was someone who would make cheesecakes from almonds, mm -hmm. and you, he wouldn't tell you that's what it was. He'd say it was cheesecake, and you'd eat it and say, wow, oh, this is really good. Yeah. And then you'd say, oh, it's not cheese at all. I know. Well, it's pretty amazing. I had a niece visited me recently, and she is vegan, and so I cooked vegan and non-vegan wow. delicacies, and I had to cook some vegan something for her, so I made uh, banana oatmeal chocolate muffins, ah. which turned out to be delicious. And if I did not tell you that they were vegan, you would have eaten them and said, oh, those are like any banana bread kind of thing. But there were other people visiting who did not want to even eat them. Because once you say they're vegan, but if I only said, oh, I made some, but because she was there, I had to tell her they were vegan. If you said, oh, look, I made some banana chocolate oatmeal, those sound really good, all those things together. But people were, oh, no, that's her. That's her stuff. That, yeah. that experience probably justified how your character acted in that story. Again, in a, in a yeah. lot of ways. I guess, I guess. Well, thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of the